Yes, I, I said that already. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The chair. Yeah, better. I saw him in Salt Shore. We trained him as an applied to the Installing a new antenna, NGHT antenna in the Canary Islands. Uh, okay, shall we start? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So let's have a conversation with the with the, the prospect for putting one of the NGHT uh, antenna. Yeah. All right. So I'd like to thank to uh, Alexander Raymond, the Costa Rica Rubino, Victor Gonzalez, and Jorge Goya for, for the help. Most of all, what I'm going to show is from them. Okay. So all the credits. To go there. And so, yeah, I, mean, I think everybody knows. It, it, would it be possible to read it? First, I think maybe. You, you can otherwise. So, as you know, uh, Canary Islands is actually the largest observatory in Europe. So, uh, and this is really, really important for us because it's all the factories there. So, we have all the roads, no, we have uh, all the connections. So, everything is, is there. Actually, the observatory of the Canary Islands consists of two different observatories in two different islands. You may have seen on the news that La Palma, because of the volcano, and uh, this is the observatory of Rocket de los Muchachos, and the other one is in the island of Tenerife. Uh, of Tenerife and the observatory of uh, uh, yeah. which are I always confuse with Paul Tira. So it's almost the same thing, but pronounced. Uh, 
All right, so it uh, it is it, it contains a really an amazing collection of of, uh, of instruments from all the from all the countries from Europe and abroad. Actually, we have there are more than sixty institutions participating in the instruments are there, and uh, from more than twenty countries from as I said from Europe and Ireland and, and abroad. So it's the most important collection of astronomical facilities that we have uh, for optical and infrared and and uh, inside the European Union. There are also the, the experiments, high energy, and uh, I'm sure all of you are aware that the city in North is going to be located in La Habana. Okay, so this is going to be again uh, quite a, an important uh, addition to the, to the observatory. And of course, of course, magic is also there. And so it, it is really an excellent uh, observatory in terms of the sky quality. And, and this is also, I think, important when you think about it, by putting a new instrument or, or by doing a great big version in, 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 of an instrument in observatory, which is that the, the, the actual, the, the, the quality of the sky and, and the sign is protected by Spanish law. Okay, so this is, and it has been there uh, since 1979. So it's, uh, if you put something there, you can, Rest assured that they are, they are not going to be, you know, social, you know, opposition or something like this. So this is really well established and well protected by the Spanish government. So I think this is uh, these two combinations that finally is protected by law and is the most important sort of thing in the European Union. I think it, it plays really nicely for putting uh, an observatory there. And what about the site? So as I said, that this will be in Tenerife, which is the, the Taylor Observatory. It's 2,400 meter. Uh, and uh, it, it has been well tested for more than 30 years, as I mentioned before. So the, the inversion rate is below the solar 80% of the time. Okay? So this is also really good. And uh, we will see the, the medium PWB is around 3.5 and also can get below 2 meter for about 30% of the time, as we are going to show uh, in a minute. And, uh, and there, there has been a long history of uh, also cosmic uh, microwave background experiments since the mid 80s. Actually, they, they, this is a collection of previous instruments and uh, working from the, the 10, 10 gigahertz all the way to 270 gigahertz that were, have been working in, in, in the site for, for quite a number of years, you know, more than three years uh, with the centimeter and millimeter uh, observations. Observatory. And they are also still ongoing, ongoing observatories. Working like as you see here, like one millimeter, and they are also a uh, Quixote, for instance, also working with uh, like relatively high frequencies and so on. So, if this is not like uh, you know, the, you would put an antenna uh, there, it's not like you know, first millimeter or millimeter observatory in there. And uh, now I'm already showing what from the Alex Wing paper in 2021. And the first one you can see is the, the PW, uh, a world map. And you can see this plot here for Canary Islands. And this is, uh, you have been seeing before this, a uh, chef has shown you already, which are the different in blue, the current EHD the antennas, and in red, the, the possible, the new uh, insights. And uh, Alex did an amazing work using MARA2 data to estimate uh, the quality of the site uh, and for, for different, uh, for all of these different locations, like you can see here, uh, CNI. So it's, it's, it's uh, PWU is small, it's good, and this also agrees with previous in situ observations. As you can see here from Castro and Montan 2016. So these are the in situ observations with this medium PWU 3.5 and below 2 meter, uh, two, sorry, two, uh, two millimeter, and uh, doing 30% of the time. So we are talking about a good side, but nevertheless, uh, it's good to have the you know, standardized uh, measurements in the possible new sites. And this is something that uh, Chef and the CFA has been uh, trying to, to, to put in all the different possible sites. And, uh, and the Chef and, and, and people from the CFA already shipped a new radiometer, which is installed there. It has been taking data since May 2021. So we are having the actual a testing of how good the site is uh, using the standardized uh, 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 instruments. And, uh, and these are preliminary uh, uh, analysis that Alex did uh, together with Victor, Jorge, and of course, of course Alberto Rubinha, and uh, comparing you know, the, 
the, uh, the uh, observations, uh, uh, the observatory measurements together with the near and geometer. So the takeaway is that uh, uh, the, the, the observatory weather monitor and the end gate monitor are really consistent in, uh, in, in, in showing very reasonable you know, view. And this is another table that, that I have over from uh, Alex paper. And you can see here on uh, the uh, cloudy days and you know, uh, sending opacity. So very, very few cloud days that you can see here in Canary Islands. And the, the typical sending opacity is, is really typical from each design. So it would be like another another each design with similar similar properties. And actually, it may be also like a good size for 3.5. And, and this is a uh, this are both with the transmitters at 3.5 comparing SMT and uh, and, uh, and you can see here that uh, this is uh, around 0. 0.6, so it's, 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 it's pretty good. And uh, the estimation is that with a 10 meter antenna in Canada Islands, uh, we can we can detect 0. 0.1 justice uh, and for the plant with 10 meter dishes in one in 100 seconds in the initial time with just 80 kilohertz uh, fringe, fringe, uh, fringe finding bandwidth. So, it could be possible that we could do uh, 3.5, and especially as we are aiming, we do uh, frequency phase transfer. So we could be having you know good antenna for doing 3.5, a significant amount of the time in Canary Island. And what about the UV coverage? How does it uh, improve the UV coverage uh, if you have an antenna in Canary Islands? Again, plots and results from Alex's paper, and you can see here the 3 and 3.5 for MX7 and for side gain star. So it is on the northern hemisphere, and actually, if you check out some of the analysis performed by Alex, CNE, so the Antenna and Canary Islands. By the way, this is the Central National Intelligence in Spanish. So this is the CIA in Spanish. <laughs> 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 so the name is. So it actually, uh, can I have the next is that the second best at the CBO uh, Antenna 4 incremental uh, increases the full uh, coverage of the uh, MSR. And it's also quite good for side A. And, uh, and let me add also that uh, if we have uh, one antenna in Canada Islands and another one in India, I mean, we, 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 we are starting a serious number of, of baselines in Europe that we're doing uh, observations of both types. So <clears throat> I do think that uh, this, is a, this is something that uh, it could uh, provide a significant leap forward for the UK uh, in, the, in, the, in the Western. Uh, and uh, it, well, in this case, eastern hemisphere of the EHT. So, and uh, let me just finalize uh, with a summary. I, I think, uh, well, this is basically what I have mentioned before, but I have not added a, a slide about the, the fundraising because, as you know, this is sometimes a little bit uh, you know, tricky. I mean, you have to show your cards or not all of them. But uh, uh, what, what is really important is that uh, we have not. Two very important projects. One is, uh, as uh, Chef has mentioned before, there's an excellent opportunity for making phase one uh, of the NGHD, including one of the Viva dishes in Canary Islands. So, this is this is a really important opportunity, Chef, and, and, and uh, together with uh, our, uh, our team here in Canada, as well as uh, Canary Islands, we have been exploring this in very detail. We are about to sign a uh, new. And, uh, and uh, there is a very good agreement from the Spanish counterpart to provide all the support if uh, we can put one of the different districts in Canary Islands. And this will be uh, the Spanish support will perform in, in two ways. One way is providing all the infrastructure, as we showed before. Canary Islands is the language of the Spanish language, so, so everything is there. And then the director of Canary Islands is doing with the possibility of having one each. Yeah, so he's willing to put. All the all the infrastructure and even take some money for the Spanish uh, Research Council. It is also has also agreed into doing all the commissioning, the building of the new uh, the new, uh, uh, of the new build the building support for for uh, all the equipment and so on. And also the Spanish Research Council has committed to run the operations of the new. Okay. So this is a really excellent option. We are very much looking forward to for proposing one of the Lima dishes there. Of course, there are all the options that we are considering. For instance, that is an excellent option of having one of the antennas from Lima with 15 meter dishes with a really, really excellent, excellent drive, excellent force uh, in the internet. So this is another possibility, and we are discussing this also with our 
this will be instead of a six meter, 15 meters, which is you know allows us to do also single design. And also keep in mind that it will be really excellent to have, for instance, one of these dishes in Canada and the other one in Namibia, because we will be covering not not and soften. So we can do you know all beautiful you know transient uh, 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 all our city is going to provide a lot of, uh, of transients and we can do the follow up either with Canary Islands or Latin America. So, so all this is going on uh, and, uh, and we are now looking also for partners. So uh, we are discussing this with Iran, we are discussing this with other partners and of course if you are interested in you think that they will be interested in contributing to this project please contact us okay? so because we'll be, we'll be delighted to we want to make this uh, uh, of course uh, international as possible as it is in exp and so we are very much looking forward for for this collaboration and uh, and, and i think this is all i wanted to say so, that would be yeah sure. Excellent. I'm really, really happy to hear everything you say. Thank you. But I just want to add a couple of things. So even if you get this large antenna, the 15 meter antenna, uh, I think it's a good idea to also get the six meter antenna. Okay, that's that's the requirement. But it can be an outrigger kind of thing. So you know, think of like SNA and JCAP. They are so good, but very, very helpful for debugging things and so on. That is actually a minor thing. Most important thing I want to tell you is that the six meter dish can be an extremely important tool for education. Oh, yeah, that's so an education of young people, particularly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So right. for radio astronomy education, this can be a huge boost. Yeah. So that's something you should definitely add to your list. Yeah, absolutely right. Absolutely right. Let's have a minute. So this is something that I said and I will probably say. It would be really fantastic to have the two of them. I mean, we, we, can, we can do it, you know. I, the, the same calibration as we are doing to the SMP and, uh, and SMA and ADO and APEX, so this will be absolutely fantastic. Right? Yeah, so I think uh, the only limitation here is, is the cost uh, and the operational cost, but I don't think it's going to add a lot of operations. And, and actually, you know, the the demand is not that big thing. So we are just talking about convenience, convenience of life. It's not that. I mean, when you are talking about, you know, Spain just bought 30 euro packets for 2,000 million. So, in 20 euro packets. Come on, just take one of the wheels of one of the euro packets. I think that's why you get a toilet from a jetliner. Oh, what? So, so I. I actually wanted to dovetail on Ramesh's uh, question and his whole point. In terms of uh, operations at, at, at the Canary Islands, uh, so it seems like there's, a, there's an infrastructure of people uh, yes. who can run the other observatories who have the opportunity of maybe you know, trained operators to organize radio strategy for people that exist in other observatories. But you have a forum. People that are experts in telescope operations, but that may be already a good start. But that's one of the key. And I was making a point earlier in the, in the plenary session. I think there's one of the things we should keep track of as an MDHD project, I think, is the idea that there are synergies in locations where you have trained people. That's going to be key. You know, if you're going to put something in a report site with it, you have to send your people. Also, there to operate the process. Yeah, absolutely. Right. I hope. In fact, uh, we were already discussing this with Alice, the director of TV Nation. TV Nation, he would not run the operations, and but actually, this is not a problem because it's funding himself on the task of doing this. But he did mention that they have technicians, which so are, you know, they've been working for the technicians and the and so they do have a, a, a training, and uh, definitely, this will be a significant thing to help. So, Jim? Uh, sorry. Oh, sorry, Gopal, do you have a follow up? No, no. Jim had a question. Yeah. yeah. You said very few cloudy days. Is that like one or 50? Yeah, I Okay, what, what is it? I think I have it. Uh, what is it? Uh, oh, oh, there. Okay, this one of the and they are okay here. So you can see one, two. So in January, one to March, two, May, zero, 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 and then two in November. 
well, with a plus minus four two. So we are talking about you know really good. Okay. Uh, usually the inversion rate is below this. Yeah. This is a book written by Jim Moran. Yeah. 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 Um, but if you if the if the 
quality of the data and the reliability are not up to snuff, uh, it could be false or common. Yeah, we are working on it. We are working on it. Okay. Okay. Uh, then the final speaker again. Yeah? I can't access that. Yes, <laughs> one Oh my! Oh, in front of me. <laughs> If I try to go to this, it just appears. Uh, okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank the organizers for coming here, Sherpa, especially for funding my trip here also, and uh, for the opportunity to make a point about something that we have been pursuing for a long time. Perhaps this is a site which is exactly opposite what Gomez <laughs> here is really <laughs> mentioned. There's nothing there. You know? And we are still we are trying to get something good. My name, perhaps I should say, I start with the I have written here, but this is in a British way because I'm more called as UIG since my uh, undergraduate time when I was they wrote UIG as my first no, like the beginning name. So I've become I've come to be known as UIG. So you don't mind if you call me UIG, I it is a personal name for me. Thank you. As uh, Gordon is uh, the one who really initiated this idea here, and Chef has come in uh, some two or three years back, and my colleagues also. Thank you. Sometimes. Okay, a few small words, but I hope that they will make a bigger impact once I throw a few things that I'm going to do. I think you spend many days. This, this, this is a very small word there, but uh, it is a really big issue. It really now and what uh, we can learn from this. See, there has been a big struggle, you can see already, that uh, started now. So, here we are talking about Kilimanjaro, and this is the Google Earth view. But from you, a lot of you may know, may understand Kilimanjaro is something that you can key near operators and all the things. Uh, take people to Nairobi instead of Kilimanjaro uh, itself. So this is a view from Tanzania into Kenya, and uh, to show how desolate it is, to show that you know there is really no life where practically there. So the moisture, the moisture, and we are really, in order to uh, make sure that we are not accessing the peak because that is the the, the, the name Kilimanjaro is for. The uh, snow, so they call it the snow in anyway, it's mentioned that these are glaciers, you know, and these are disappearing glaciers, and uh, we hope that uh, we can maintain them. But we are talking of the saddle here between the two peaks so on the right is the, I'm sorry, on the right, oh, sorry. Pointed. Yeah, yeah. This, this, this is Mawensi Peak. And this is the Kilimanjaro peak. This is at 5,000, nearly 6,000 meters. And this is at 5,000 meters. And we are working in the middle here at 4,500 here. So a few points about each of these sites. This is a uh, view to show uh, a, a gentle uh, slope. Uh, it is high and dry. And the, and the most important point, which I should have made here, is it, it, it has been so this pre standing mountain, so that all the weather will go around. That's why the, 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 the peak is not, uh, is not, is not inhabited or uh, no, no life basically there. So it's uh, and it is at the equator. So we are talking of really a, a weather which is not expected to change too much, the, the seasonal variation. Uh, we also not expected to be plenty of space. We hope that if we can get this project on, then they will benefit perhaps by attracting other uh, facilities also because there's a lot of space there. 
And we are also saying that Mamoyeli, which is the other peak, which is the more jagged peak, nobody climbs that usually. It looks much more harder. But with correct engineering, you could uh, have a site even at uh, a, we could have a high, even higher site here. So this is the perhaps uh, beginning of Kili being Kili. Like Kili, by the way, the word Kilimanjaro is Kilima. Kilima means mountain. And then Jaro is the local name for the mountain, you know, like Kilimanjaro. So uh, Kili, we, we shorten it to Kili often, you know. So Kili is now coming into the map of you know, most of the map that you will see. You won't see Kili, you will see the other one that comes back here. But uh, we are saying that if we look at the network now, as a part of the this one we show the current EST, but these are the new and new 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 facilities that can enter in the in the NG EST network. And uh, the, within with this network, we are saying that the Kili is the easternmost side, so it's, it will begin to see much earlier. You have a, you have a bigger time frame, and with a baseline with a Canary Island, for example it would be uh, sufficient to give you good data at uh, both uh, So here, this is the simulation. Uh, the orange uh, uh, parts are for Kili, and you can see already one side. The orange parts, you can see. You can see that it is widening the, the, the area of the black hole that you could you, you could observe you can see in both cases here at 230 um, gigahertz yeah because this is for uh, the m87 it is able to hide it and also for our milky way black hole uh, this is uh, the simulation for uh, Again, uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the widening of the uh, uh, space, there, there are many places that are that were blank, and now they are filled in by the Keeley Canary baseline here. So we are increasing our our view of the detail. Of, uh, this is the time. Uh, View time by time frame view where you will see that Kilimanjaro starts to be visible right from the early stage, and then this is the advantage at both for both objects up to now. Okay, so this is for 350 45. You can see even uh, wider view there with Kilimanjaro contributing right from the beginning. Uh, this one is the number of baselines that you could get for uh, you could increase the, the orange one here is for the Kili uh, canary baseline. You can see that it will increase the number of baselines for from 80 to 110 or something like that. So this is a significant chunk of increase uh, with Kilimanjaro in the in the network, even for uh, the SGRA, it is uh, almost uh, doubling the number of uh, uh, here. So this is uh, one of the issues which I wanted to also talk about, that uh, access. Uh, how did we get access to Kilimanjaro? At least we hope that it is now ready. But it's a long process. Uh, Gordon uh, contacted me in 2010 uh, uh, with the idea. And I've been trying to say it in my I'm, I'm not a radio astronomer and astrophysicist in terms of physics. My background is physics and environmental physics. But uh, I've been trying to push astronomy since for, for, for decades now. So I was interested and I couldn't say yes at that time. But I've been pursuing in my own way to get some instrument out there. You know, like an old school spy camera or something like that, where we could say that no, we can go up, we can maintain the equipment. So, just to show that we can do things, and uh, it took a long time. 
And uh, in 2018, we started now to get uh, the government to be interested, to, to, to get an interest from the government. So we wrote a proposal for a telescope which would be on Kilimanjaro, but which would not impact the environment. And we insisted that the cable way would be the best access because really we are looking into at that time during those uh, 10 years back, we were looking at the ESG contribution. So we are saying we are talking about a large, huge telescope. So we would need a cable way access for that. And uh, that uh, had, uh, was uh, sort of, let's say, the, the authority. This is a, a UNESCO protected site, World Heritage Site. So it became, I don't know about that also, but uh, uh, there was a lot of resistance from the government itself and the authority which is governing that, which, which is the uh, manager administering the, the, the mountain. So the parks, this is part of the national park. So when we brought that uh, idea, they said, no, 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 we already have this idea for a long time, you know? So they did uh, allow us even to talk about the telescope. So it was as if the cable way was, <laughs> was a bad, bad, bad guy. In, in, in our project. So still we pursued, and now um, I'll talk about the, 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 the political issue that uh, we have uh, had, we, we got access to the government to get access to Kilimanjaro through another line, through the another ministry totally unrelated to science. So through, through the tourism ministry, that look, we, have, we can do a lot of attractions because Kilimanjaro is a well-known mountain and we are going to do some astronomy there and including our astronomy at the equator where we are saying that almost you know in one night you will see 95 percent of the sky you start from the evening till the early the, the, the following morning so extra tourism is what we are selling uh, the selling point here <laughs> and to, uh, to uh, the, the idea was to reduce the environmental impact but uh, now the, the, the other issue that I want to talk about is how to get our local expertise to really work together. Because uh, we are spread out, we don't have extremely high qualified people in, in this area, and we are still uh, in that process. The education was uh, increasing capacity, is a very important uh, aspect. So we have sought uh, to sign, you know, I am a uh, agreements with. Uh, several universities, including technical and academic universities, uh, for uh, collaboration. So this was, in fact, what uh, the government also realized, that how are you going to run this project? So we have a collaboration of universities in, uh, so that we have different um, engineering as well as um, uh, academic fields coming together. The other issue was uh, the culture cultural means community involvement. Now, here we feel that although the, the site itself is uh, above the occupied area, the, the Kilimanjaro area is occupied by uh, people who have only had a uh, benefit of the, from the colonial times. They benefited a lot. They were, they were, they were the people who uh, accepted Christianity and they were able to benefit from the education which they got. So they are one of the uh, more, 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 more economically advanced groups in Tanzania. So they are more likely to, 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 to accept it. But we are saying that also, this is the site is above the, the normal uh, area where they live. Uh, they may be still be sites which they consider to be. They do, they have heard of the mountain as being a, a holy, uh, Holy place and all that. So we want to also make sure that uh, we work together with them. We are, so we are starting to do that. Now, with the political, this is the the, 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 the point that we are trying to also say, say that without the topmost people to be in our um, uh, to, to be to, to be agreed to, 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 to buy this uh, through economic benefits of tourism, technology, science. Uh, uh, there were, for example, you may have an example of another uh, protected site where there was expected to be a road through a national park. So here there was uh, this next uh, 
issue which uh, is about since UNESCO is the World Heritage Site becomes in the international um, attention. So uh, there was a similar cry for Serengeti. There was a road which was I think you might, you might, you might have heard about Serengeti at the famous national park. So there was a lot of resistance, but eventually I think it was because of the political will that there was a particular place where the road was able to pass. So we hope that there will not be too much uh, outcry because we are still looking at the saddle area only and hopefully not disturbing the, 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 the climber's view, even with whatever facilities we are going to have on Kilimanjaro. Now, in terms of the environmental issue, the, the, the excess is, it is possible to access even currently up to nearly 4,000 meters by road. There is already a road access up to one of the, one of the um, uh, climbing, climbing uh, points. So at Horongo. So there, there are, there are but we, we are still also thinking of uh, when we talk, when we choose the site, we should choose the site which is uh, perhaps uh, out of view. I mean, from even from the peak, we, we should find a location where uh, it will not be so much visible to tourists who are visiting there. And uh, hopefully that we can use the power supply, which is also not disturbing the environment. So we are now preparing, we have an MOU now with uh, the SAO. We are, we, are, we are working on an MOU with the SAO and then for a radiometer to be uh, placed uh, for moisture, water vapor measurement, cloud cover and other, uh, at, least one, at least one season of measurements. And uh, we have been working here over the past few days also with uh, a deadline on uh, getting the permit because uh, we want to visit it uh, in September. Uh, so we hope that to get a radiometer from Chef's team and uh, we have to test it first in, in the slum itself and then hope to install it up there and do a visual site inspection of where uh, we could position the telescope once it is. But the, the radiometer itself would be placed at uh, one of the um, climbing, climbing uh, stops at Kibobas, which is nearly at 4,200 to 200 meters, which is nearly the same as the site also. And we are also planning to, to talk with the local communities uh, involving the local authorities and through them to access the local communities so that we can understand if they will be talking with the others and to find out how we can work together to get to benefit the local communities also. In terms of the environmental impact, of also we would like to see when we are going up there our physical visit. We have a team uh, from Chef's uh, team and our own local team who will be uh, able to at least iron out or at least understand some of the obvious environmental issues so that we avoid them and we, we, we take account of them before in the project itself, before we submit it for our official the, uh, environmental impact assessment by the government. So uh, it has been a long road, and uh, uh, the, it will be just because of perseverance that uh, we have reached this stage where I've been able to present this to you. I've been saying this word for, a, for as many places that I go, but I think this is the right place for me to be to convince people that really this is a good place to come and uh, uh, not only visit as tourists, but also as astronomers. Mm -hmm. So, and this is the point about, uh, I hope that our exposure to the wider community will not bring eh, any, 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 any resistance or anything like that. So we still need to sell this idea that it is a suitable site, it is a reasonable site, and it will not impact the tourism or the market itself. And to make sure that uh, the experiences of uh, Manokea and all that are not repeated here, we want to write right from the beginning. We want to make sure that we go to the Thank you very much. In terms of funding, we are, we, are, we are also, I mean, now that we have some collaboration, we are talking of uh, networks and all that. Please, if you would like to visit Kilimanjaro, guys, already to start it, but also to be part of our team, uh, we are all ready to start. 
Thank you. Go back. So I would like to ask a couple of questions just to get the context. Uh, so I, are you uh, uh, associated with the university yourself personally? Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I am. I am. I am. I'm a retired senior lecturer at the Open University of Pennsylvania. But uh, I was I continued even after my the post this was the post retirement at one time a couple of years back. Now government said no more contracts. I mean I was on a contract and so I was retired totally. But then I pursued I was, this has been I've been doing this since uh, my astronomy career has been since the 70s, you know. And this particular project uh, has been with me for the past 10 12 years. So I still continue. I mean, I would still be in contact with the people and all that. So they are now I'm recognized as a consultant to the university. But I'm teaching also at another private university. I'm there. Please go ahead. Um, how do you see yourself in the future? Like, what do you want to do? No, my idea is based on the fact that it is the community which is receptive to, which have benefited already. They have seen the advantages of education, of development, and they have adopted a lot of uh, Western style. You know, for example, you know, the country which is famous there. You know. So uh, we hope that uh, even the villagers, the, the elders, uh, will be will be ready because uh, uh, we are we are we are making contact now. We are making contact now. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> are all the sites you showed in Kenya, or or some across the border in Tanzania? And is uh, the Kenyan government probably supportive? No, this mountain is in Tanzania. Oh, okay. It's in Tanzania. That's what I'm saying. If people think that it is in Kenya. Oh. And people and, and tourists uh, and this is, they, they take them to Nairobi and you can access from Kenya also, but then uh, they have to enter, enter Tanzania for, for, for that purpose. But the, the better access and better clients are from the Tanzania side. So uh, it's not. I was just showing you that often you will see Kilimanjaro, even in books, even in tourist in, 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 in guides, in, in tourist guides, they'll show a picture. Uh, of uh, Kibo, uh, I mean the, the main thing on the uh, on the right rather than on the left. I, may, I mentioned it to Lonely Planet also once a day. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we just means is that uh, I'm, I'm taking a picture from Tanzania rather than. Kopa. So just another comment. I think uh, our experience with the LMP. Which is located at 4,600 meters in the country of Mexico, mm -hmm. around just below the, on the first foothill of those mountains are the Navajo people, so the indigenous people that live in, in Mexico. They're, they've been there for thousands of years doing more or less subsistence farming. Okay. And a lot of the telescope uh, site people these days mm -hmm. in the LMP are the Navajo people that have been trained and uh, they are experts now in telescope systems uh, and, and they're very proud of their involvement. And there's a point of pride in the whole community that there are people from their community working at their own team. Uh, I think this is a good thing to pull in in terms of the cultural considerations is to, you know, I think it's to involve this community from the beginning in the project, in the, in the project and, and even employ them. I think that on some of the problems in other instances, such as maybe to some extent in some of these projects in Hawaii, has been the lack of native people, the, 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 the local people involved in the politics. I mean, as I said, the, the Chaga people, these are the, the Chaga people that we the credit for Chaga, they are uh, among the most widespread, I mean, other persons than you will find in the world. Uh, higher institutions and you know and, and well paid uh, jobs so so these are people who have already benefited and they know uh, so we, we i'm sure that even the current uh, elders who are there have seen the benefits and we also intend of course to uh, find i'm sure that we are, we are going to find some local people who are already perhaps oriented in the, along this line and we could absorb them also the local, some of the local people. Yeah, I think that is a good idea. Although nobody's living there, 
to make still something that this would be a useful thing to be involved in. And then one step. Okay. Yes, if, if the site is in the saddle, does the mountain block any sources for a significant amount? Yeah. Well, um, I think the uh, if we are talking about 200 and 5,000, let's say 2,000 meter, and we are talking about 100 uh, the saddle area is uh, uh, maybe a kilometer wide. So the angle of view, the horizon view at some point maybe, but better about uh, almost the whole sky should be. Uh, so that's not and, and, and it is on in a in a in east west orientation. Okay. So, so the northern sky and the northern sky are uh yeah. Okay, I guess now uh, let's give up another Thank you very much. should talk about the overall um linear. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Nitika. I'm a fourth year graduate student at Caltech, and I'm going to talk about uh, millimeter astronomy broadly at the Owen Valley Radio Observatory. So, I'm sure as many of you know, uh, this is going to be the first new site to test out the NGEHT, and you know, we're going to do fringe testing in 2024, it sounds like. And I've been talking to Janice a lot at this meeting talking about that. Uh, but that's not the only millimeter project happening at Owens Valley. So I also want to spend some time uh, doing some shameless self-promotion on another project we're working on there. Um, so I, you'll notice that this slide only has my name on it because about half the time I spent actually making the presentation, I was stressed about accrediting everybody who should be on this project and decided that if I wrote a slide full of everybody's names, no one would be able to do that because they'd be very tiny. So. Um, but yeah, so I, I think I'm giving this presentation on behalf of Greg and Vikram, who are the PIs of so many different projects at Owens Valley, as well as our entire team at the observatory and all of the people who work there. So, uh, and this is a photograph of our site for anybody who hasn't been there. It's located in the beautiful Sierra Nevada mountains. And I like this photograph because you can see a lot of the different telescopes that are there. So. Uh, here you'll see this is the 40 meter dish, which is the biggest one on site. Way back here, which is kind of hard to see, this is the VLBA dish that's in Owens Valley. And here, these, these six dishes here are the 10 meter dishes, one of which will end up being the new NGHT dish. Uh, so for those of you who've never been there before, Owens Valley Radio Observatory is located in between the Sierra Nevadas and in between the I guess the westernmost mountains of Duck Valley National Park, the White Mountains. And so here's Caltech here, right uh, north of Los Angeles. And what Vikram and I like to say is that it's three to four hours away, depending on how fast you prefer to drive on this highway. Um, so, and I'm sure that Karma needs no introduction to most people here, but I always like to put a slide like this for some sentiment that. So right now, all of these dishes are on the valley floor at about 4,000 feet. But when Karma was operational, it actually used to be in the high site in the White Mountains, which gave it that much better, uh, you know, better beeper for uh, doing millimeter astronomy, which unfortunately we do lose on the valley floor. But the benefit of being on the valley floor is that you don't have to drive up to the mountains every time you want to access your telescope. And, you know, I just really wanted to put this uh, plot from Chef's 2008 paper because when I first read this paper, I thought it was super cool that Karma was involved in these early detections of Sagittarius A star and it feels really full circle now to be able to say there's going to be an NGEHT dish at Oro once again. So anyway, like I said, aside from the NGEHT, that would be one of the six 10 meter dishes that are currently on site. Another one is currently being used for a cosmology project called COMAP that's led by Kieran Cleary out of Caltech. And currently two more of these 10 meter dishes are going to be this project called Sprite, which is a single baseline millimeter interferometer that we're going to use to do time domain studies. So I just wanna spend a few slides talking about that. 
uh, science case for Sprite is basically that we have all of these super wonderful millimeter instruments out in the world, some of them like the ACT and SBT 3G and experiments like CMBS4 coming up are in very sensitive places like probing deep into CMB missions. And of course, like there are telescopes like ALMA, NOEMA, and SMA, which are these wonderful interferometers located at high sites that are making really beautiful and deep images of objects in the universe. But what I think is really missing from millimeter astronomy in general are instruments that are focused on time domain studies. So like CMB experiments, for example, now moving forward are making transient space science priority by putting transient detection pipelines in their back end. But ultimately, they're still not designed to do transient experiments. And instruments like ALMA and SMA and NOEMA, I think that the reality is that these instruments are capable of so much more than transients that it would be remiss to be using them to monitor transient sources every day. And so when I say transients, what are we talking about? So I like to split up uh, sources that I think should be monitored into the millimeter as sources that should be monitored in sources that should be followed up from like optical uh, discovery missions like ZTF, for example. So those would include things like um, long GRB afterglows, which is something that, you know, Karma was extremely good at detecting, and other um, transients like interacting supernovae or these fast blue optical transients that we're learning now should be bright in the millimeter early on. We just need to have some program to be observing them so that we can build up a population of light curves and understand better what the population of these events are. And then other sources that are slightly more constant in the sky would be like AGN and EHT targets, which we would be super interested in monitoring, of course, and there's been a long history of monitoring AGN with the 40 meter at Owens Valley. And, you know, something that Daryl had talked about, of course, is also X-ray binaries, which come in two states, like their active states and their quiet states. And they're very interesting to observe in both states, especially when they're active. And then recently from instruments like SPT and ACT, we've learned that a big source of millimeter transients in the local universe, or actually just our local space is flaring stars. And it's not been observed until the last few years that these are extremely numerous and millimeter bright. And the origin of their emission has now resurfaced as a big mystery in the field. So that would be another thing we're super interested in monitoring. So just a little bit about Sprite. So uh, I, I'll put it out there now that I didn't come up with the name. This is all Vikram. So if you don't like it, you can pick it up with him. So but Sprite stands for the Stokes Polarization Radio Interferometer for Time Domain Experiments. Personally, I'm not sure why any telescope needs the word Stokes and polarization in it, but I think uh, it makes the name good. So anyway, right now we're working on what we call Sprite phase one, which is going to be a single baseline interferometer. And we're primarily going to use 100 gigahertz, but the old Karma receivers also have a one millimeter receiver on them. And then there's also a centimeter observing mode. Um, the baseline that we've chosen is super short, only 24 meters. And the reason for that is that because it's only single baseline, we're not actually interested in resolving individual sources. And we're just counting on the fact that since our synthesized beam width is about six arc seconds, hopefully there aren't two incredible transients happening within six arc seconds of each other at any point on the sky. And additionally, this helps us increase our coherence time because as you know, if you have a longer baseline and your coherence time gets shorter. And as we're on the valley floor, we're trying to make the most of what we can. And then we, so we haven't started measuring or calibrating anything yet, but we anticipate given the past performance of these dishes, that was a one hour integration, we should be able to get down to about a three millijansky RMS. So uh, for anyone that's interested, I just wanted to go through a little bit of what we see as the signal path for Sprite and also talk about what we've done so far and what still needs to be done. So uh, Sprite, when signals come through, they hit the SIS mixers that are in the receivers, similar to what was talked about earlier this morning, and they get down converted to an IF of one to nine gigahertz. So the receivers and the cooling systems and the compressors and all of that, as well as the IF transmission system is pre-existing from Karma. So we were really lucky not to have to reconstruct any of that. So what we did for Sprite is first, we put in our own second stage down conversion system that I installed earlier this year. 
And we're using uh, two Roach 2 boards, which have ABCs on board for sampling. So right now, even though we, the IF is eight gigahertz, because of the ADCs that we have currently, we're only able to make use of the central four gigahertz, uh, or sorry, the central five gigahertz of this band. But we are hoping that for Sprite phase two to actually make use of these uh, EHT 60 gigahertz boards and pair them with, uh, even though Rajni said that these are not optimal this morning, I'm going to think about more, we're planning to pair them with an ABC 128 for our correlator. So most of this, is done already, and we have a correlator design that we're borrowing from Jack Hickish that was written for Amy that we've modified a bit to work for Sprite. And so most of this is done. What we need to do now really is work on um, pointing calibrations and understanding like what is the biggest error in our single dish pointing, work on our interferometric pointing scheme, and also measure uh, the SEFD and elevation dependent gains for these telescopes. And then following that, um, once we're ready to start taking uh, commissioning observations, we'll have to put together this data analysis pipeline that will extract the flux from the visibilities. And then we'll be well on our way to what we're optimistically hoping for is observing transients by the end of this year. So then what does that mean for the EHT? So because the EHT is making use of these same 10 meter dishes, we're hoping that a lot of these commissioning procedures that we come up with will be directly applicable to when the NDHT station is coming online. So the good news is that, so back here, if you can see, oh, and I should point out these dishes in the foreground, these are the uh, dishes that are part of the DSA 110. So if you're interested in fast radio bursts, this is part of the array that's been detecting fast radio bursts from the Owens Valley. And back behind those dishes here, so this is the Meyer Control Building. And in the basement of this building is where all of the computers for products across the OVRO live. It's where the correlator and down converter for Sprite lives. And we do have an empty new slot on our computer rack now where the infrastructure for the HT will live as well. So just recently, we've gotten our observatory staff who've been super fast at doing this actually to lay fibers from each of the 10 meter dishes down to the wire control building. So all the connections are ready in the basement. So whenever uh, things need to be hooked up to fiber, we're completely prepared for that. The receivers in both of the Sprite dishes are sealed and cooled. So we're optimistic that this shouldn't be super problematic for um, the EHT. And our control systems are functioning as well. And this will be the same control system that we'll use to do at least initial pointing measurements for the EHT. I, I'm not actually sure if the EHT is planning to put in their own control system for the future, but we can at least start with our own. And we're also really happy to say that the oscillators we've been using on our telescopes are able to be locked and they're functioning. So if that's infrastructure that the NGHT needs, then we know that these are working. Uh, and then aside from that, we've had the 10 megahertz maser signal from the BLBA station sent over to the fire control building. And right now, uh, Jonathan has sent over some equipment to do phase noise testing. I know the staff at Owens Valley is working on that. And like I said, our computer room has a slot ready for the HT infrastructure. And once Sprite is operational, we're planning to use Sprite to do interferometric pointing for the NGEHT dish. And after all that, we'll just be waiting for uh, the old LMT receiver to arrive on site. So I think I can say with great confidence that there is a ton of enthusiasm, especially from a lot of the Owens Valley staff who worked on Karma now to be bringing back full meter astronomy to the Owens Valley. And uh, yeah, if you're interested in chatting more about this, uh, this is my email and yeah, we're just super excited. Thank you. My question is actually for GoPro. But can you give an update on the timeline on the receiver? Yeah, this might maybe it's not the uh, It's more like 24 April that the receiver will work. Updates on the timeline. I saw that, and I was wondering you can always remove the receiver early from the LMT. Uh, you could. Yeah, yeah that's the good. risk for the PhD, but can I, I, I think, well, I think a few of us are sitting here and could make a statement that the, the, the message from Gopal was received down and clear that things are running later for the um, okay. for the new LMT receiver 
and uh, internally we have not reset our schedule and there's a process of trying to figure out whether we can mitigate the schedule so, okay so that's all right that's that's the official SAO position what's up there you know right so it's skeptical but that's that's where we're at we we have, we have not changed our goals for our road but what are the issues primarily JPL's uh, you know, getting back to online after the pandemic? And 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 go Paul, I, I think your um, your uh, scheduled estimate assumed a respin of the junctions, yes. which is not necessarily going to be necessary. So okay. we may not buy that to find that way. Okay. Um, I'm I'm probably closer to you than to the official position. Oh yeah, we have to be extremely careful to preserve yeah. a working receiver at LMT. Yeah. I think everybody is completely wide awake. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the shell game we have to play. Let's be yeah. careful about when it can come up. Yeah, we don't want to go to that again, right? Yes, <laughs> yeah. But I have another quick question. Um, Please. Uh, I don't think we have to Oh, sorry, yes, actually. Yeah, if anybody. No, nobody no, it's just out of interest, actually, how to get track. Uh, are the other 10 meters in use? Are they, you know, is Caltech actually allowed to be married? Are they available in principle? So, for sure, three of the antennas are spoken for one of them for COMAP, two of them for Sprite, and then for this fourth one for the NGEHT station. Uh, I personally will say that I don't know what the status of the other two is. That would definitely have to be taken up with the graduate program, but there might be some plans for that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, that's FEMA 60 oh, no. oh, no. oh, oh, yeah. I should say that these are so these are like the latent dishes, and yeah. there are these other six meter dishes. I think there's four of them that no, are. I, I, I don't know the, the, the six meter. Now, the reason why I'm asking is because the latent dishes are actually extremely transportable. The way that they're being manufactured, actually, they're more, that's kind of being more manufactured more like in the optical mirror, where you have to run the way. So, in fact, the, the, the shape of the dish is extremely stable for uh, transportation. Yeah. So, like I say, that we have made deep inquiries about okay, those 10 meter dishes. Uh, uh, the, the Caltech goes very well our interest. Okay. In those dishes, but I think I sense that there is some local interest in so we are not really willing at the moment to entertain. Uh, there's, there's one on Mauna Kea. Yes. The CSO is, is a is a, a, a safe dish yeah. in a nice dome. Yeah, and I think and, and we've been talking to people about that too, but they they have their own flights. The the CSO has their own flights. They have their own flights. Okay. Yeah, I oh, think this I think the CSO dish is the end. Transported. I think the CSO dish is, if I understand correctly, like, being transported to oh, yeah. Chile for a different yeah. project. Yeah. 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 Um, Bupa? So I actually wanted to go back to your sprite presentation, just kind of neat. Uh, I just wanted to ask you about the operational model. How do you intend to follow attention? So what is the I understand the, 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 the instrumentation, but what is your operational model of how you capture? Trenches and how are you going to follow up? And are you looking at visibility as well? What's the science? yeah? So we're not so we're not planning to be a discovery instrument. We're planning to take triggers from optical wide field surveys like UPF or, or Atlas, and if they discover something that is nearby and something we predict would be millimeter bright, so we're thinking like supernovae or. Um, Supernovae in the local universe or nearby extra binaries or tidal disruption events that are particularly bright. We think these are things that would be within bright sensitivity. And then we would come up with a plan to like monitor them maybe every every few days or so. And then intermittent between these, we would pick a list of sources that we think should be monitored more closely. So like a list of AGN that are of interest to the community, a list of nearby stars that have been shown to flare via some of these, um, like like SPT and ACT have recently released a list of transients, and most of them are are flaring stars. So maybe a list of nearby stars that we think should be active and as such. But you're going to follow visibility quite Yeah, time. yeah. Oh, yeah. That's right. So since it's a single baseline, we're going to fit directly to the visibilities to extract the. And it'll be a light curves only instrument. 
which we are hoping to make available to the community. We just haven't come up with a scheme yet for exactly how we're planning to do that. Okay. So, uh, uh, is it going to be quite a little similar to for uh, the energy overall experiment? Uh, because I don't think Opal's means proper stuff will fit in there. No, it's not also yeah. should be. Sorry? It's not also being shipped. It's not, but yeah, that's the same question. So, yeah, that only will not work if all the land will be available. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So uh, actually, I wanted to bring up uh, the question of the other NCA dishes, which we have. Those are the only dishes we have talked about at all. Which ones? <laughs> the NCA. Oh. Yes. Three and a half meter dishes. It was a very interesting idea Vikram uh, suggested uh, when, when he was at VHR. Uh, was that uh, you could use one of those dishes for interpretive content mm -hmm. and it is a so that's an interesting thought. At Ozali or at different sites? Well, no, whichever no, no. different site, wherever, for okay. example, the six meter dish goes. Also, you know, you get one dish, have this one for free, something like that. That as a trouble role, and of course, that's a great idea. In principle, uh, it is a good idea, but uh, there's a whole lot of complications, right? You have to have one fiber, you can just get to knock that all up together. Yeah, you can build another, you can build a cheap receiver for it around the back. Right. Yeah. Still need another full receiver. By the way, it has received the, the SEO dishes now for both of these years. Okay. Uh, so the, the, the receiver does get yeah. some work. Yeah. It's still, there's a, it, it, I mean, I agree, in principle, it sounds like a really good yeah. idea. It would be a little analog correlation just for that purpose. For example, it's a bit of limit. I think it's a possibility to be used for use of of dishes. Yeah. Uh, I think it's probably it takes a takes a very strong argument for it. But uh, I don't necessarily be label this as the overall millimeter field guy for it. I mean, I don't think you want to go in there with a shopping cart. Throwing stuff in there, right? So there's some spaces where you can get break out of it. And, uh, oh, let me just thank you again. Um, Yeah, I don't